Jamen, velkommen til alle sammen. Det er en talk i dag, vi skal have med Paul Grafacek fra ITU, som skal fortælle lidt om autenticiteten og nostalgien inden for retrospil. Det er et spændt, han forsker lidt i, og han er ligesom kommet her og skal fortælle os lidt, fordi det går sådan lidt i ånd med, med det, vi har lavet her de sidste to dage. Øhm, det er stablet på med et samarbejde blandt øh, Kulturmuseet og øh, Vejlebibliotekerne, og vi har fået lov til at være her i Spænderihallerne og gøre det. Og det er simpelthen støttet af Sydbankfonden, Phoenix og Trækantsområdets festuge. <laughs> øhm, så ja, jeg vil egentlig bare øh, give plads ja. til Paul. Så ja, jo. Tak. Uh, right and uh, yeah, uh, so uh, it worked. Yeah, so uh, a few words uh, about myself. Although I was already introduced, uh, my name is Pavel Gravarczyk, uh, and I work at uh, the IT University of Copenhagen, where I uh, study games, uh, also uh, computational education. But this is not relevant for today's uh, meeting. And uh, when it comes to uh, study. Uh, of games, I'm doing uh, many different things, but uh, amongst them, I'm very much interested in uh, gaming history, and uh, especially on how this history influenced our today's gaming landscape and what kind of trends from history uh, determined what we have today. So, uh, uh, retro gaming is a, is a huge part of what I do. Uh, so. I guess I have to point here, yeah. So, uh, my main aim of, of the talk today is that I, I wanted to talk about how did we get from something like this, which is uh, one of the private pictures, many private pictures published on Reddit, of someone who just uh, bought uh, an Amiga and set uh, up his uh, or her small uh, retro gaming corner in the, in the room. How did we get from this humble beginnings to this, which is kind of like a dream uh, retro room of everyone, I'm guessing. And it would be pretty hard and expensive to have, especially because of these arcade machines. There are some more pictures, and they have even more arcade machines there. Uh, but so I wanted to see this trajectory, this evolution of retro gaming, of uh, how did this happen that we ended up with uh, such a lavish display at some people's houses. And, uh, and what, especially, what are the reasons why retro gaming looks like it does today? So, uh, for starters, I wanted to do a little, a few bits of theory, and uh, I, uh, I promised it won't be much, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's needed to understand what I want to uh, tell you today. So, first of all, uh, I will be talking about retro gaming using two important distinctions, which are, I mean, they have their, you know, more academic counterparts, but they are, I believe, actually fairly easy to grasp. So the first one, the academic version, is that it's a difference between something uh, uh, that scholars call restorative and reflective nostalgia. And for, for our current purpose, we can just boil it down or simplify it to the difference between preservation and innovation. Uh, the easiest way to see it is to see, to look at the modern retro games, uh, specifically independent games. If you look at modern independent retro games, retro inspired in the, uh, independent games, what you see is that some of them try to replicate the original games, and but some the other games try to sort of um, reflect on them and change them, make a twist to them. Uh, add some stuff that wasn't possible back in the day. So preservation or the idea of authenticity is to try to reproduce something as it was, whereas innovation is the idea of let's take our past and sort of uh, remix it. And I think that these two uh, forces are two most important forces that shape retro gaming. But there's also one more distinction that I want to introduce, and this is the distinction between, I just have to get used to it, uh, the difference between official and vernacular expression of history. And this is again, more academic uh, distinction, and, but we can boil it down and simplify it for today's talk to the difference between official and informal or unofficial retro movements. And this difference is simply that when you look at any history process, 
you have the official side of history, that is all the institutions, all the archives, everything that collects stuff and tries to preserve it, but also you have this very, you know, uh, 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 bottom-up uh, grassroots movements where people try to make their own personal archives, their own personal collections, and so on and so forth. So, in retro gaming, I would say this is also a hugely important difference between everything that happened on the official side and when we talk about official, in terms of retro gaming, the most important aspect of this official part is all the corporations that hold the rights to games. And this unofficial part where just, you know, fans and hobbyists and enthusiasts try to do something with their collections. And I think that these two distinctions are important because I believe that the, the whole retro landscape is uh, influenced mostly by, by these four factors. Preservation, innovation, official movements and informal movements. So this is more or less uh, the theoretical uh, uh, um, introduction. But if you want to talk about retro gaming, uh, it would be also good to just plainly state what exactly counts as retro. What is really, like, what do we count as retro and non-retro games? Because uh, um, it would be tough to talk about it without you know, any boundaries in, in, in our minds. So uh, I use this meme because I think that it really uh, uh, gets to the point. Uh, like, where exactly do we draw the line? And some people might be irritated when you call a given machine a retro machine. And we're like, yeah, come on, this is not retro, this is just old. So what's, what's the difference here and how do we draw this line? So I have some ideas, uh, and you know, to introduce these ideas, I, I just want to mention that it seems to me that's the first thing, that the notion of retro is a typical fuzzy term. And when we talk about fuzzy terms, fuzzy terms are not as bad as just vague terms. Vague terms are terms that we actually don't know how to use. If a term is vague, we feel that every time we use it, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to use it. But fuzzy terms are a little bit better, but still not perfect. Fuzzy terms are simply, uh, as, uh, they can be explained uh, using this picture, that when a term is fuzzy, what it means that there are things on each side of the spectrum that are very easy for you to use this term uh, to refer to. It's super easy for you to tell, okay, this is retro and this is not retro, but there's always this middle part where it where it's becomes fuzzy, where it becomes uh, very hard to apply. And we, when, when you are actually not sure if you can use the term retro or any other term. So a, a textbook example of this is the term bold. If you talk about bold people, I mean, on this side, yeah, this is a bold man, this is not a bold man, and then you are just in the middle, like balding, boldish, I don't know, I, I'm not sure what to do with that. And this is, again, I think that retro is exactly this kind of term. So when we have, uh, when we go back to the retro notions, if I show you this, this is Atari 2600, and I ask you, is this retro hardware? I'm pretty sure that people will say, yeah, of course, this is retro hardware. It's almost as retro as it gets. Uh, and if I show you this, PlayStation 4 Pro, and I ask you, if this is, is this retro? People will be like, of course not. This is, the, I mean, come on, are you joking? Uh, 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 and, but then if you go here, at this point, people might be like, I don't know, maybe in a month or something, maybe in two months it'll be counted as retro. I'm not sure about it. And it becomes fuzzy. This is the fuzzy part. So I think this is simply a fuzzy term. And this happens. This is normal. We have fuzzy terms in language bold, young, and many other, and there's no other way of, of you know, solving this fuzziness problem uh, uh, other than just make a rather, you know, uh, clear cut and arbitrary decision, okay, this counts as, as, as retro and this doesn't. So probably this is what we have to do uh, here. And uh, there is one simple clear cut that people might have in mind. And this simple clear cut would be to uh, define retro as next to last generation. So if you do this, if you try to define this like that, we could say, and I tried to make this presentation future proof, so imagine that you are one month in the future where PS5 is the current gen. Uh, so uh, in a month, 
And this is actually also a good mental exercise because it shows how artificial this, uh, this thinking is. In a month, this will be the current gen, this will be the last gen, and this will be next to last gen, so this will be retro. If you, you, you can use this a very clear-cut distinction, and it's not horrible. I would say it's not the, 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 the worst distinction I could uh, come up with, but it has some problems. The most important problem is that it leads to some classification uncertainties, so to speak. So, for example, the biggest problem that we have when it comes to retro is this machine, that is PC. I mean, how do you classify PC games then? Because you don't have these clear-cut generations. There are no clear-cut generations in the PC space. Of course, you can try to make them. You can say that, oh, the DOS era is one generation and the Windows era is the second generation. But why exactly? It doesn't really work that way. When Windows 95 was introduced, DOS games ran fine and they didn't run differently from uh, what we have now with, let's say, 32-bit applications on Windows 10. So it seems very artificial. PC is a very interesting example because PC s makes it almost impossible to make clear-cut retro non-retro distinctions. And here it's very, very much fuzzy. Uh, but PC is not the only problematic platform or not the only problematic aspect of, of, of uh, retro classification. The other thing is a fairly new phenomenon that is so-called live games. If you take the live games into account, you have a problem because uh, uh, just look at this example. Let's take Assassin's Creed 2 which belongs to this generation, and this would make this game retro game according to this, you know, uh, provisory definition that I just suggested. And let's say that you agree. Let's say, oh yes, that's fine. Of course, again, on the PC side, you might have a problem. You might say, yeah, on the PC, it just looks pretty nice, and you know, I can up it, and it's like, why would I call it retro? But let's say that, you know, for the sake of discussion, that we're fine with it, that this is a, an example of a, of a retro game, very, very, very uh, uh, new retro game, so to speak. But then you have games like that, Minecraft and League of Legends, and would you call these games retro? I doubt it. I highly doubt any people would call Minecraft and League of Legends retro. But the problem is these games were released exactly the same year as Assassin's Creed 2. It's just that they are live games and they are constantly updated and they are constantly played. So in our perception, they are much less retro than this. But if you just take the year of release as a, uh, as a boundary, it's, I mean, they should be classified exactly the same way. So uh, why not? And so this suggests that maybe it's not only about generations, there is something to it. But it's not only about generations. The notion of retro also has another component. And it seems that a game becomes retro when it is discontinued or abandoned that people feel that this is a retro game because uh, you can't buy it new, you can't, uh, uh, I mean, it's not uh, uh, supported by the company, and so on and so forth. So this feeling of abandonment, uh, uh, being abandoned, is also, I think, a very important aspect of why people classify something as retro. Uh, when I said that uh, uh, people often feel that a game becomes retro when it's abandoned because you can't buy it new, for example, this introduces another problem. This is a very, this is a, let's say, a, uh, a criterion that you could use uh, five, ten years ago. But nowadays it becomes much harder because games are sold digitally, so they uh, never go out of print uh, in a, in any sense. They may not be available anymore digitally for different reasons. Like I don't know, Forza Horizon was delisted one month ago or two weeks ago for Forza Horizon Three, but. This was delisted from the digital storefronts because of legal reasons, because uh, they would have to uh, 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 prolong uh, the contracts with car manufacturers. So it's a different thing. When it comes to digital distribution, a game can be sold forever. So it never is really abandoned. So this, it's, a, it's a little bit of a problem for retro games, for the notion of retro games. I think that the biggest reason why we think about retro using these two criteria, and as I believe we do, that it's fairly long ago, two generations or so ago, and it's been abandoned, 
because of how historically we started to use retro. So what I wanted to do now is to just look at how did we use the term retro when it started to be used and how the term retro, how retro gaming started as a, as a, as a thing, as a phenomenon that people started to recognize. So if you look at the beginnings, uh, the closest thing to early retro games that I can find is uh, text adventure games that were published for 16-bit computers. So imagine this. I mean, you, you, you have to make a, a little bit of a mental exercise now. Imagine you bought uh, your new shiny Commodore Amiga, a new 16-bit computers, all the graphics and stuff. And then this is the new game released for it. You might feel like, oh, God, it's, it, sound, it, it feels a bit retro. It's just text. But still, I would say that this cases of early uh, text adventures being released for 16-bit computers, people didn't feel or people didn't perceive, per, uh, perceive these games as retro. And the reason for it was that they were actually sort of HD version of text adventures. In what sense? Well, you can see this here because you could, using 16-bit computers, using better resolutions, you could actually display a lot of text uh, instead of a much smaller number of lines on the 8-bit computer. So they felt much uh, you know, easier and nicer to play. So they didn't feel just as an old game that was released on my computer. They felt like an upgrade. So I would say that even though this is close to retro, the beginnings of retro, I would still say that this wasn't really retro. What happened later is that uh, some people started to include bonus old games in their new games. And uh, one famous example of this is Day of the Tentacle, uh, a very uh, a classic adventure from LucasArts. And this game, it was a sequel, Day of the Ten Tentacle was a sequel to the game called Manic Mansion, and it contained the whole game, the whole classic Manic Mansion, the whole prequel, so to speak, inside the, the new one. So if you went up in this text adventure, you could use a computer in this new game and play the entire old game inside your new game. But this was treated as a bonus, as an Easter egg. It wasn't advertised, oh, by the way, you get this retro cool game. No, nobody said that. It was just a, it was a bonus. And the same can be said, as you can see, this is 1993, and the same can be said by about uh, uh, this game, which is not that well known. Uh, I guess for a reason, because it was actually a, a fairly standard platformer, 16-bit platformer of the time, Pac-Man 2. It is not similar to classic Pac-Man in any way, apart from the, the, uh, the graphics that it uses, the Pac-Man characters and so on. But it was just a platformer. But if you look at the back of the box, uh, the back of the box tells you that apart from this main game, the main course that you are going to consume, you have also the retro original Pac-Man inside if you, you know, want to play it. But still, it doesn't use the term retro, it just uses the word classic and so on and so forth. It's, and, and also, this again is just a bonus, just an addition. So I would say that the first example of, like, of retro advertised as retro would be a... Uh, uh, when we go after 16-bit uh, generation. Uh, and there is a reason for that. At the time, there was this growing feeling, the need to play old games. And uh, what was the reason for that? The simple reason was that, that at the time when you moved from the 8-bit to the 16-bit machines, whether it was the console space or if it even was a, a computer space, if you moved from Commodore 64 to Commodore Amiga, you just had to abandon all the games you had because these machines were not compatible with each other. So there was a feeling of lost library for people who had to sell their own, their, their, their old machines to buy the new ones. You had to abandon everything and you, and you might started to want to, you know, recapture this old stuff that you wanted at some point. So, this move from 8 to 16-bit generation, I think, influenced retro gaming and the notion of retro because it created this, this void, this feeling that, oh, I lost all my games. Well, I have all these new ones, that's cool, but at some point I might, ah, 
ah, I would actually like to play this old game, but you can't do that because these machines are com in, uh, incompatible and you also can't do it because these machines, the difference between these machines is only one generation. And what it means is that uh, Commodore Amiga, as mighty computer as it was, it couldn't just emulate Commodore 64. It was not powerful enough to emulate uh, Commodore 64. So there was no way for you to, to play these games uh, through official or uh, non-official means. Uh, so I think that this move made this distinction that I made at the beginning very uh, prominent. That when we started to talk about retro when there was a bigger time buffer, bigger than one generation, and on top of that, the, the object that we call retro, whether it's software, whether it's a game, or whether it's a, 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 a machine, it, we started to perceive it as discontinued or abandoned. So with Commodore or with uh, uh, NES, the company stopped producing it, the company stopped uh, uh, producing games for it, and so on and so forth. So we feel, okay, this is an old machine now. Uh, and I think that, the, as I said, the closest we get to, the, to things advertised as retro, treated as retro, is in the 32-bit generation, where the, the, the Sony PlayStation receives this package, Namco Museum. And this, I would say that the, the, the usage of the word museum is very uh, telling here. They were sold as old games. They weren't sold as just classics. This was the point. You are buying a museum piece. And this was a collection of four arcade games, as you can see, Pac-Man, uh, Galaga, Pole Position, and New Rally X. And uh, people could play them, but here's the twist. They are sold as museum pieces. But at the same time, if you just take the context of this release into account, it was more complex because these games are not emulated versions of NES games or computer games from homes. They were emulated versions. Technically, they were, weren't even emulated. They were pre-programmed, but th th that's not, not, not very important right now. These games were, ver were simply perfect versions of arcade games. And you never could play these arcade games at your home. These were these you know, big arcades where you had to put your coins in. So even though it was sold as a museum piece, it was sort of a novelty for people. It was the first time I can play a perfect version of Pac-Man. It was the first time I can play, especially with pole position, this was very important. This game weren't uh, released for any other hardware before in, in perfect arcade state. So that was retro, but not really. I would say that this is an example of a, of a retro as we know it uh, today. This is, a, this is a collection of Activision games from Atari 2600 released on the PlayStation. And here you can't be, 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 there is no novelty. There is only nostalgia aspect for this package. You are buying things you had as a kid. You are buying things you saw uh, uh, when you were a kid and so on and so forth. Or you're just curious because you might not have been born then, back then. So, uh, so as you can see on the official side, on the side of what has been published by, by companies, uh, retro is a fairly new phenomenon. It's uh, more or less uh, 96, 97, if you look at it. Something advertised as retro. But on the unofficial side, something interesting started to be happening. 1990s marks the beginning of the age of very easily accessible emulators. This is the moment where people start to uh, discover emulators. And what emulators are, as you, uh, as you probably very well know, it, uh, is software that enables you to uh, mimic the behavior of another computer so you can just take a game from your original computer and run it on something else. And this is the moment where it starts to spread. And at the beginning, it started with emulators of 8-bit machines, such as ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, and they were released for PCs, typically, at the time. So you could, all of a sudden, you know, play your Spectrum games on a, on a PC. Much more powerful PC, but it was, of course, a very nice novelty. But it very quickly exploded and started to be perceived as close to piracy. So this created a tension between this unofficial, informal side of retro, people creating emulators of machines that they loved and that they wanted to be still, you know, playable, 
uh, and the official side which started to perceive it as piracy. And there was a big uh, reason for that. And there are two emulators that I want to mention that are especially responsible for this connection of retro gaming and piracy. The first one is MAME, which is still a very uh, uh, popular emulator. It's an emulator of, wow, now I would have to say everything, I guess, because it's, it really emulates so many machines, but originally it was uh, uh, called multi-arcade machine emulator. So originally it was an emulator of many arcade machines, many machines for the coin machines. So you could play the perfect versions of Pac-Man even earlier, uh, uh, easily here. And the problem with this was that just as with this PlayStation example, many companies which hold the rights to arcade games felt that, well, there is money in it if I just release my arcade game on the home machines and tell people this is the arcade perfect version, people might want to buy it because there was never arcade perfect ideal recreation of this game at home machines, but main sort of uh, make it made it problematic because all of a sudden, people could have arcade perfect games at home for free. So there was this connection between piracy and, uh, and retro gaming because of MAME, but I think that even more important moment, the watershed moment for this connection, for this tension between formal and informal retro gaming was this release. It was Ultra HLE. It's a Nintendo 64 emulator that was running Super Mario 64 in 1999. And again, this is where some historical context is needed. Think of that, 1999 is three years after this game was released. So three years after this game was released, people were able to play it for free if they copied the ROM from the internet. The internet was you know, very well, much alive and kicking uh, at this point. Uh, but this was also a paradigm change for emulators because normally people associated emulators with this possibility of you know running games of machines that were I don't know from ancient times but whereas here it kind of felt like I remember when I, when I played Ultra HLE I felt like almost I like I pirated not the game like I pirated the hardware just like here is Nintendo 64, this expensive console that is three years on the, in, on the market, and I, and I don't have to buy it. I can just, you know, fake it somehow, and it works. It was a magical moment for many people, and they made, uh, it made them realize that emulators are actually much more than, than retro gaming, but it was also a very risky moment because it creates the tension between emulator community and all the official channels. And, uh, this, this tension uh, is still very, very visible. One example of this would be the shutdown of this website, or rather not a shutdown, but a complete change of this website, Emu Paradise, which was a website containing a lot of emulators and a lot of uh, uh, games that you could download. And after Nintendo uh, uh, sort of attacked this, this, uh, this website, or rather uh, they sent them uh, a threat, uh, they, they had to uh, remove all the, all, the, all the downloads. The same happened to another website which was very important for PC gaming. It was called Home of the Underdogs, and it, is, it was a website devoted to, as the name suggests, underdogs. It was the website devoted to uh, old, but also not very well-known games. And, 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 and many games that uh, are very hard to find elsewhere were on this website. The website still functions, but the downloads are eliminated for the same reasons, because there was a copyright strike. And uh, we don't have to look much further for this tension. Uh, just look at the last month's release of Super Mario 3D All-Stars, which is a new release for, Nintendo, for the Nintendo Switch. And a lot of people from retro community were a little bit unhappy about this collection. Why? Because they realized when they looked how it is constructed, they realized that all these three games in the collection are actually emulated on the Switch. So, there are emula so this is a just emulated version of, of Mario 64 and so, on for, uh, and so on. And they felt that, okay, if it's just emulated version, I could do it for free for like five years. Why would I pay for this? And so, so this creates tension because on, on one side, companies have to somehow compete with the, uh, with the emulation uh, community. Uh, and it's uh, even more pronounced with things like that. This is a short YouTube clip 
of Nintendo Switch emulation, which is also possible, and this is Zelda Breath of the Wild that runs in 60 FPS. You have to uh, believe me, because it's 30 now because of the camera and so on. But it's, uh, but it's 60 FPS and 4K. So you can play uh, the game in a much better quality than on your Switch. So it's a little bit sim similar to this Nintendo 64 situation uh, that emulators start to em emulators start to move from retro to modern gaming as well. So now I would like to talk about two main ways retro community uses emulators and all everything else to uh, to what to do what do what they do to do what they love. And the first most important aspect is this preservation aspect that I mentioned when I was talking about the distinctions. So first of all, what, what does the retro gaming community do to, to preserve stuff? First of all, a lot of informal groups create very comprehensive archives of games. One of, one of these examples is TOSEC, the old school emulation center. It's, this is an informal group that created huge archives of games that were very interesting from the historical point standpoint. They were interesting because they not only contained just a game, they contained every version of this game. So they, they were very, very, they were trying to just preserve, even if there was a, a, a minuscule difference in a version of a game, they tried to put it in their archives. So they are very comprehensive archives. Uh, uh, many institutional archives are not as good as this. Uh, one very important aspect that this kind of archivists remember is that when you archive games, it's not only about the biggest hits. It's not about the games that you really want to play. There are so many games that no one ever heard about, and they often try to just, you know, archive all these very weird games that were printed in, you know, very small number of copies and probably not sold that much. So if you look at how many of these games are in the wild, it's a, it's a very small number. Uh, and I got a, an interesting example of this is this game called Super Gun for the NES. And it is interesting because it is one of, one of the uh, uh, lay, uh, uh, last games for the NES that were archived as a, as a digital representation of cartridge that is called a ROM. And uh, this was, it was physically available, but it was not possible. They were not, uh, uh, people were not uh, uh, able to get it to copy the, uh, copy the software. So it was in 2019. So one additional aspect of this is that this uh, informal communities, archiving communities, they also preserve their own past. So this is an example of so-called intro. And I had to put the music on as well, because it's pretty cool. And uh, the trick is that this is, this is a game that what you're looking at is not a game. What you're looking at is so-called intro. An intro is a, a signature of a group of pirates of the time that cracked the game and make it available for people who just got the pirated copy. So if we wanted to be super legit, we wouldn't have this version of the game with these nice graphics. And let me tell you, if you had the Commodore 64 back then, many times this pirate introduction was the best part of the game because it was probably the best graphics you could see. The game later didn't look that good. So these are often just works of art and we would have lost it if we didn't think about it. And all these informal groups, they also archive their own history, the piracy history. Uh, so one, one other example that is, I think, very telling is this game, uh, uh, Warcraft Adventures. This is a game that Blizzard wanted to make at some point. There were, there, there were previews, there were screenshots and so on, but this game was never released because Blizzard was never happy with the result. Uh, the game was almost finished and it was at some point found and released by, by these informal communities. So you can actually play it. I'm not sure if you can finish it, but you can play it. Uh, so apart from preserving software, these groups are also preserving hardware. So there are, if you, restoration of old computers, you can just uh, go to YouTube and see what tricks these groups use to restore old computers. 
And it's not only about the casings, it's also a lot of things, parts of electronics that you have to exchange for new parts. It's not an easy thing. They also try to preserve the machines through hardware emulation. This is a, um, a screenshot of uh, Mister, one of the hardware solutions. I, I've been told that you can actually place uh, stuff on uh, on Mister Final Fight, if I remember correctly, uh, here uh, uh, in the library, uh, in the exposition. This is basically, I don't have that much time to explain it, but this is a solution that this small box can act as a Commodore, as, as, as uh, Amiga, as Atari, as NES, NES, and what have you, up to 16-bit uh, machines, and it actually acts like these machines. So you can have a very similar experience uh, as with the original. And this is completely a, a bottom-up movement. Uh, also through emulation of unpopular hardware. We have so many em emulators of popular hardware, but what about all this weird hardware? And would these emulators ever existed if, if, the, if the fans uh, didn't have this uh, urge to, to emulate everything, to archive everything? There's this obsession, we have to have everything, even if it's completely uninteresting. So, but this is actually a good example of a very interesting console. FM Towns was an was a incredibly powerful Japanese console that was not popular at all because it was just too expensive. They overshoot it. They created too, it was too good. Uh, simply. Uh, this example uh, is a very different. It's called Action Max. It's also uh, emulated right now. This is a machine that uses VHS tapes, so videotapes, uh, but it, you, might w you might look at it and be like, wow, where do they put the tapes? Like it's so small. Well, you don't put the tapes anywhere. You have to have your VHS machine. You connect it to this, you buy a movie, and then you play a, a simplified shooter on this. There are five games released. Oh, not good, but interesting. Uh, or something like that. This is a Yugoslavian computer, Galaxia, that was, uh, again, uh, created in, in, in this country. And some software was created in this country. And like people would have probably forgotten about it if, we were, if, if, if it wasn't for this bottom-up movement. Or one more example, Nuon. It's a very weird machine. It's actually a DVD player that had gaming as an addition. So it had a dedicated gamepad, and it actually had one game released for it, I think. Uh, but actually a very good one, Tempest 3000 by Jeff Winter. It's a very, uh, 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 very, very good game. Uh, or some even weirder stuff, like suing machines for Game Boy. So there was a Game Boy sewing machine, dedicated Game Boy, but produced by actual sewing machine manufacturers, Singer, you can see the Singer, for example, machine here, and there was software for it, and in 2019, there's a group of people who want to emulate that. I'm not sure how, how. probably just you, you will have some software that will just translate it for modern sewing machines. So if you ever wanted to do something like that, why not? And, but also through reconstruction of hardware, this picture might, if you just look at it without thinking, it might not look anything special. But it is special because this person is using a light gun with an LCD screen, which is impossible. You can't use a light gun for an LCD screen. You need CRT television for light guns. So what happens? Retro community creates a special new version of light gun that works with LCD screens. It works a little bit differently. It has a camera there, and, uh, but it works. And you can play it with all the old emulators as well. So you can play all the arcade light gun games with an actual light gun. Or if you are unhappy with your ROMs copied from your own cartridges or downloaded from the internet, you can buy so-called reproductions. There's an amateur versions of amateur reconstructions of cartridges of games that are normally very expensive and only, this one maybe not, but there are some games that are very expensive and only a collector's item. But now you can buy the actual hard uh, cartridge. So why would you do that? Because you want the authenticity. You want to have a physical object that you put in your console. So again, bottom-up uh, uh, initiative. And if you go through this, preserving software, preserving hardware, where, where do you end up? Well you might want to also preserve your experience that goes beyond the software and hardware, or maybe that is just very individualized. 
So the sheer reproduction of software and hardware is harder. So what do I mean by preserving the experience? Well, first of all, you might want to have the version of the game that you remember playable. There are so many ports and versions. This is Chase HQ, many versions, right? And let's and normally, if you just look at it from a from a very uh, I would say pragmatic perspective, you might be like, let's emulate the original. This is the arcade, or let's emulate the best version, which happens the same to be the same. But then people might be like, yeah, but I remember this Spectrum version. It's not that good, but I want it because this is part of my experience, and I want to relive my my per, uh, personal experience. Another example is that there are inferior versions of games that you want, might want to preserve because they just remind you of what you played. This is an example of uh, Sonic. This is how it runs on a 60 hertz machine. And this is 50 hertz. I know, if you're like me, whenever I listen to a music that is slowed down in a second, I would just feel like bad almost, like, uh, like almost like VR sickness or something. Uh, this, is, this is what happens when you play a game in, on a 50 hertz version. 50 hertz versions of games were sold in Europe. So we had 50 hertz versions that were 17% slower than what Americans had. And it pertained to everything, to the gameplay and to the music. So their experience, their, their, their experience that people in Europe remember is different. So now when you emulate it, again, from the pragmatic perspective, it's a no-brainer, you should go with this one. But then, if you want to preserve your individual experience, you should, you should have, obviously, an option. And one more example, you have three uh, revisions of Commodore 64, and you'll be, you might be like, at, well, okay, I might like this casing, this was the one I had, but this, 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 I might like this casing, you might be liking this casing or whatever, but it's not about the casing. Well, the, the other difference here is that the, the music chip in this, in these machines were a little bit different. There was a revision that Commodore, uh, the company made, and it makes the sound different. So if you don't remember it, uh, 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 as it, as it sounded, you might feel a little bit less nostalgic, which is not what you came here for. So emulators, good emulator, FPGA, for example, emulators uh, like Mister, they have the possibility of switching between these two type of chips. So you relieve your own experience. And let's not forget about colors. If you played games on CRT TVs, CRT TVs differed widely. So they could look, I mean, all of this, any of this, could be your personal memory of Mario if you played Mario. Uh, so which is correct, the correct one? Of course there's no correct one. It's, there's, just all, there's just the one you remember as a person, the one that you had. But some choices have to be made, and emulators give you the options uh, so the community remembers about it and gives you all these options. Download one of these 15 palettes so you, you can choose whatever you wish. And one more example of this is using uh, or simulating TV screens. So this is uh, uh, Harvest Moon just displayed as it is with graphics without any alterations. And this is how it looks with filters applied. So there are two differences here. First of all, the picture is darker, of course, right? But it's also more pronounced. Some things, this looks more round, and it didn't look that round now. But more importantly, also, this text is glowing a little bit, like, like it glowed on the, on the TV. So you can see there's this glowing effect, which is nice, and people remember it. So for some people, this is absurd. For some people, this is changing a, a much better picture to a, a little bit fuzzy, weird picture. But for some people, this is exactly what they wanted because they want to relieve the experience. What they want to preserve is the experience. There is also a more objective argument for it, and, and it is that if you look at this picture and this picture, the difference is that if you change this to a more TV-like setting, you can see that games at the time, the graphics at the time, since the developers knew that these games will be displayed on TVs and they will be fuzzy and there will be scan lines. Since the developers knew it, the argument goes is that the developers created their graphics in such a way so they look so they so so it looks good on a TV. 
And it sometimes really does work. So if you apply all these filters, all of a sudden this pillar from Final Fantasy VII looks very like 3D-like, whereas here the, the result is completely lost. And last but not least, of course, if you had a TV, sometimes you might have had uh, the whole casing. But if you have a casing, the graphics uh, ref is sometimes a reflected a little bit on the casing. So some emulators give you the ability to render a fake case that reflects the, the, uh, the graphics in real time. So you can have this feeling of a TV reflecting this. You could see this very well here, right? So why not? This is outside that if there's a motto for retro gaming, it's why not? And apart from preservation that I said, preserving software, hardware, experience, you also have this side of innovation, right? So what do you do? Right? What happens is that what happened is that at two, to a certain point, all the, all, the, all the power, all the focus of emulation was on making it as accurate as possible, as close to the original as possible. But at some point you have so much computing power that you can do more, that you can actually do stuff that wasn't possible. So, it was, so it's no longer about authenticity, it's more about, okay, what, what would have happened if these machines were actually with us here, with the possibilities? So how would they change? If, if we had these possibilities. And this is the answer to that. You can enhance and modernize these games. For example, this is, is a good example of a, of a game that is simply, it was a driver, but now it's, it's a better example. This is a PlayStation emulator that runs the game in its original resolution and here in a much higher resolution. So you can now just play games on uh, uh, PlayStation games with higher resolution without a problem up to 4K or maybe even more. Um, on the 8-bit side, you had a famous problem of, of blinking of sprites because the machines couldn't display all the sprites at the same time, so they alternated between the sprites, so they were blinking. And it was just a technical problem, and in most emulators you can just switch it off. You also can add safe states where they weren't possible, the games, many of these games didn't have safe states, now they do have. And as with many innovations that I mention from now on, many of these innovations were created in this uh, informal side of retro gaming, but they found their way into the formal side. So safe states for emulators were, you know, they were very well known for years. But now if you look at what Nintendo did with uh, Nintendo Switch emulation of NES on their service, they have safe states as well. Uh, uh, when you, uh, the, the example that I just, that I just has shown, uh, up, uh, up, uh, upscaling the resolution of a game, of an older game, again, if you look at what Sony PlayStation uh, 4 does to Sony PlayStation 2 games, those that are moved to PlayStation 4, such as, uh, let's say, I don't know, Jack and Daxter, or uh, uh, that was actually a proper remake. So a better example would be Red Faction, let's say. Um, uh, you have a version of this game, and it is also uppressed. So it doesn't look like on the original PlayStation 2. It's uh, uppressed just like on emulators. Uh, and, of course, saving is boring, so you can have a proper rewind, like almost uh, uh, as if it was a movie. Now someone died, whoops, okay, just press on a button. On a, and you can just repeat, rinse and repeat. And this is also uh, 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 moved to uh, some official emulator side. Uh, and sometimes you can just change something that from the authenticity standpoint might have been actually uh, a crime. So, no, 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 I want this to be played. So this, on the left side, you have, well, uh, the picture on the left side is what the emulator does to PlayStation emulation. On the right side, you have the original. The big difference here that you might uh, uh, not notice for a second, but if you know PlayStation, you probably saw it, is that PlayStation had these wobbling textures, these warping textures, like here on the ground. 
And here, nothing like that happens. So they eliminated a very, very famous, I would say, the signature uh, flaw of PlayStation hardware, which, as I said, some people might say, well, so you kind of removed what made this hardware special in a way. But some other people might say, but yeah, that was a flaw. If the, if the engineers of PlayStation had more money, they would never do that, right? So, so that's why we can't do that. So that's an interesting narrative here. Uh, also, you can improve graphics by creating HD mods of old games. This is Castlevania for the NES. And this is an original, original game. It's just that uh, the emulators give you possibility to put uh, different sprites and tiles in a game so it looks modern. But the, the game logic is the same. Or uh, you can go even further. You can take Final Fantasy IX that this is a PC version of Final Fantasy IX. As you can see, these characters are pretty sharp, but the background is not sharp because you can't sharpen it. It's just a bitmap image that has a certain number of pixels and you can't just magically uh, add pixels to it. Or can you? Well, you can if you just use artificial intelligence. And if you use artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence may simply predict how the graphics, uh, uh, what, what, are, what the additional missing pictures are, uh, pixels are. And this is how the mod for uh, uh, Final Fantasy IX looks for, uh, on a PC right now. Uh, it's fully playable, uh, all the backgrounds are changed. Uh, or you can translate games that everybody wanted to, uh, to be translated, but the company never bothered. Again, the tension here is very, very palpable because the company maybe wanted to do it next year, let's say, but now that's a problem, right? Because you have a translation. Or if you don't want to wait for translations because it takes time to translate game from Japanese to English, of course, especially if it has a lot of text, maybe you can just do that. Use artificial, uh, use AI translation on a game. This is RetroArch, an emulator that enables you to just translate everything from Japanese in real time uh, using AI. Of course, it's not perfect, just uses Google Translate and stuff like that that is publicly available, but it's much better than nothing if you don't know, I mean, if you don't know Japanese, the best would be to learn Japanese, but who has the time for that? Uh, and maybe if you miss achievements, if you want to have more ach achievements like you have on Xbox or trophies like you have on PlayStation 3, if you miss them in your retro games, it is possible to have them now. There is a unified system for achievements for retro games, and people add these achievements, and when you play them in an emulator, it works exactly as if it was on PlayStation or on Xbox. It pops up, the achievements pops up, you get points, you amass a, a, a total po a number of points, and so on and so forth. So this is how it looks. Uh, I played Bonk's Adventure and got some achievements and didn't get many more. Uh, but you can just have your achievement trophies list for retro games now. And let's not forget the fact that you can play the old games in VR. This is 3D uh, Sen, an emulator that enables you to play NES games in sort of a, it's not really, it's not really, you know, uh, uh, the perspective is more like a, uh, a diorama that you look at something like that, right? And this is just a 3D representation, but you can also play it in VR. So when you play Mario or something, you just pick and look what happens in the game. It has to be created, a patch has to be created per game. It's not like it magically transforms something. Someone has to work on it a little bit. But then, it, last time I checked, it contains 70 games or something that are supported. So it's pretty impressive. Or of course, Doom is on everything, so it should also be on VR. You can play Doom in VR easily, right? Uh, it doesn't look, it, it looks a bit silly because interface, uh, of course, wasn't designed in such a way, but you can look at your gun kind of like, okay, it's not the best looking gun ever, but you get the points, like be, be, uh, better than nothing. And you might even say that it's actually uh, accurate to how sprites worked in Doom. If you ever tried to go around the tree of, in Doom, you know what I mean. Uh, and apart from enhancing, this was all the enhancing that you can do on the innovation side. You can also modify. You can try to create new from the old. 
So the, the, the best place to go when it comes to this is ROM Hacking Net, which contains a huge number of so-called hacks. That is, new games, well, sometimes they are very minuscule, like changing colors or changing the difficulty settings, but sometimes they change everything, and it's actually a completely new game that just happens to run on the same engine. An example of this would be uh, Flames of Eternity, which is uh, uh, a new game that, uh, that the fans created in order to bridge the gap between Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. Uh, but also, if you just don't want to wait or create, you can download one of many so-called randomizers, which is, uh, which is software that randomizes some aspects of the game that you know very well. And this solves a problem that a lot of people might have when you play a retro game from, let's say, 20 years ago, uh, uh, for 20 years, uh, well, this wouldn't be possible, but uh, for 10 years, uh, then you might know it too well, and it starts to be boring for you. So there is software that randomizes some of the aspects of the game so it feels fresh for you every time, and you can do it in, uh, uh, you know, infinitely. And, uh, and if you don't want to enhance, if you don't want to modify, you can even create. So you can create new games for retro hardware. This is a game published in 2020. It's a, some kind of a new version of Tetris published for the 8-bit Atari. There are so many of them. Uh, another example would be a, a port of uh, Another World for Commodore 64, which is not released, but there is a demo, and hopefully it will be released. Uh, or you can actually, these were ports, but you can actually create something completely new, right? Like a new nice platformer for the Amiga, why not? Again, this is upcoming. Uh, or you can create something that people call a demake. It is create a version of a new game for an ancient hardware. Here it is, this is supposed to be Halo for Atari 2600. I mean, as much as you can make it. It's, they don't call it a port, more of it just like, I, it's, it's a, again, an exercise in, in thought experiments. What would have happened if Halo ran on Atari 2600? How would it have looked like? This is one of the answers. Or maybe you would like to create the whole hardware, a new hardware, a sort of a, a fantasy version of the evolution of the hardware you love. And this is ZX, ZX Spectrum Next. This is simply a new version of ZX Spectrum, which is a, a sort of a paradox. It's a new machine. It's much better than ZX Spectrum, but it's still in no sense a modern machine. It's kind of like a 16-bit computer. It's close, close, it's close to, let's say, uh, Atari ST or something like that, probably less than that. And then you can create games for it. So you create, a, I would say, this is almost like a parallel world where ZX Spectrum never died, and they created a new version for it, and then we create software for it. So it's, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a fun way of thinking about how would history would like if, if Sinclair created a, a, a new machine. And at the end, I would like to say something about preservation of today's software, because we shouldn't forget when we talk about retro and retro gaming, that present, the present is the future retro. So preservation starts now, and we have to remember, but we, when we have fun with all these retro games, we have to remember that right now, there are so many games that we are losing. We are, con we are losing, and in 20 years, if someone ha is nostalgic about them, they might have as big of a problem as, as, we, are, or we, ha as we have, uh, when, uh, if they want to run it. So uh, there are some time-limited games, very new release, Super Mario 35, a game that was released for the Switch, I think, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. But it will be taken, uh, 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 taken down uh, 31st of March, I think. So it will no longer be available. So play it while it lasts, because Nintendo Switch is a closed system. And it might be hard to get it uh, into it. Uh, or uh, a very, another very interesting example is uh, The Legend of Zelda created for something called Satellaview. This was a radio broadcast that was added to Zelda and told a new story and gave new directions to the player. And it, it was 
event-based, so you had to be there and listen to the broadcast at the time, and it was done only five times, and we have none of these recordings, so you won't be able to play it ever. Uh, or PT, the famous uh, 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 demo created by Kojima uh, for, uh, for the new Silent Hill uh, game that never materialized, and now it is delisted from, from the shop, you can't uh, download it any, uh, anymore. And even if you did, you can't download it from your download history. So this game exists only as long as PlayStation 4s with it on their hard drive exists, or as long as people will have uh, some way of uh, getting it out. Or so many Flash games. Flash is discontinued. And there are so many Flash games. Where, wh what are we supposed to do with them? Some of them are online and so on. So, or of course, let's not forget about, forget about defunct MMO games. Uh, this is again, uh, probably Mission Impossible to, uh, how do you preserve them? How do you, for example, show, uh, show them in the museum? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. So my point is only that let's not forget about that. Let's think that, let's remember that retro in the future is what we have now. And we should be constantly thinking about preserving stuff if we are interested in this kind of his digital history. So, thanks for your attention. Will you come up? Yes, and uh, thanks for your presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I, I have no questions right now, but I think they will uh, show up uh, in maybe an hour's time or something like that. But um, this is uh, the last talk from Retro Game Days. So um, yeah, thank you and. Uh, Goodbye to the potential viewers out there. And um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.